1994, an extremist-based government in the African country of Rwanda targeted members of the ethnic minority Tutsi in what is known as the Rwandan Genocide. Over the course of just three months, government troops along with civilian death squads slaughtered nearly one million men, women, and children alike. The atrocity has since been called the most horrible and systematic human massacre since the extermination of the Jews by the Nazis. Weapons were crude, machetes, rocks, nail-studded clubs. Hate radio stations demonized the Tutsi. One broadcast read, These people are a dirty race. This is the only solution. These cockroaches who called me, where did they go? They surely have been exterminated. Outside nations watched the events in Rwanda unfold without any interference. The whole world failed Rwanda. By examining in detail the events before, during, and after the genocide, it can be determined that as a direct result of widespread international indifference, the response of the world to the killings in Rwanda was, in fact, a failure, bringing to the table an age-old question. What responsibilities do nations have for protecting human rights in other countries? <laughs> In 1944, following World War II and the Holocaust, a Polish lawyer by the name of Raphael Lemkin sought to describe Nazi policies in the systematic mass slaughter of European Jews. He formed the word genocide by combining geno from the Greek word for race or tribe with side from the Latin word for killing. The next year, prosecutors used the word genocide for the first time at the International Military Tribunal held at Nuremberg, Germany, where top Nazis were charged with crimes against humanity. On December 9, 1948, the United Nations approved the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, which established genocide as an international crime. It defined genocide as acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethical, racial, or religious group. Genocide is not only about killing, it's about a killing people in a way so that any survivors will never be able to understand themselves. Perhaps humankind's ultimate crime, to kill people solely because of who they are. Following the formation of the United Nations in 1945, the countries of the world vowed that the events of World War II would never again be repeated. However, the world has failed repeatedly in its promise of never again. Several genocides have occurred since the Holocaust, but the killings in Rwanda in particular served as a chilling reminder that there is still work to be done. Thousands of years ago, the first settlers in Rwanda made a living by farming and raising cattle. Over time, an aristocracy arose. This group eventually came to be known as the Tutsi, while others were labeled as Hutu. As of 1993, Rwanda's population was 85% Hutu, 14% Tutsi, and 1% Twa, a third ethnic group of hunter-gatherer pygmies. Ethnic divisions were established and furthered during a period of Belgian colonialism in Rwanda. Belgium gave the Tutsi minority advantages over Hutus and required that all Rwandans carry identity cards that classified people by their ethnicity. In 1959, the Belgians essentially switched sides, supporting the Hutu majority and carrying out a revolution, one that forced as many as 300,000 Tutsis to leave the country. Even after Belgium granted Rwanda independence in 1962, Hutus retained political power, under which Tutsis faced extensive discrimination and violence. After years of tension, civil war broke out in 1990, when the Rwandan Patriot Front, RPF, a Tutsi rebel group, invaded from the north. The invasion angered Hutu extremists, who consequently accused all Tutsis of being rebels. The war came to an end in August of 1993 when both sides signed the Arusha Accords, a power-sharing agreement. However, even at that time, it was clear that something was brewing beneath the surface. After the Civil War, Hutu extremists launched a campaign of dehumanization, laying the foundation for a planned large-scale extermination attempt. A big part of the cultural and religious industry in the lead-up to the genocide was to convince people that certain people weren't people at all. The Hutu power extremists in Rwanda determined to eliminate uh, the Tutsi because they were obliged to share power with them. Radical leaders imported machetes and drew up lists of Tutsis and moderate Hutus to assassinate. Others trained in armed youth militias. Political leaders sent messages of propaganda through the media, using terms like subhuman and cockroaches to condemn Tutsis and anyone who supported them. Then on April 6, 1994, a plane carrying the Rwandan president, a Hutu, was shot down. Hutu extremists took the act as a signal to launch their plan for mass murder. Within hours of the crash, widespread ethnic violence exploded all over the country. The genocide itself was extremely brutal. There are those who still today are very traumatized by the reality of it. The story of how the killings unfolded is, is pretty well known. It began within hours after the shooting down of the president's airplane, which suggests how 
well organized. The, the, uh, the brutal level of brutality was just vast. In just 100 days, the population of Rwanda was decimated. Tutsis, suspected Tutsi sympathizers, and even people thought to resemble a Tutsi were killed in their homes or in the streets. Those who helped Tutsis became targets themselves. Many killed their neighbors and friends just to prevent suspicion. Women were systematically raped. Some managed to hide or escape, but many supposed safe places were targeted. In total, more than 200,000 are thought to have taken part in the killings. It is said that the dead of Rwanda accumulated at nearly three times the rate of Jewish dead during the Holocaust. In July of 1994, the killing frenzy came to an end when the RPF, after regrouping in neighboring Burundi, captured Kigali, overthrowing the radical Hutu government and seizing power. Other genocides have occurred in the time since the Holocaust, but even today, something distinguishes the Rwandan genocide from other instances of mass murder. This one really was preventable. Not all of them are. In fact, many terrible situations going on in the world are ones that we can only lament. This is not one of them. And it could have been squashed very quickly. It would have sent a signal to those determined to commit genocide that they were not going to be allowed to get away with it. A full three months before the genocide began, Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire, head of UN peacekeeping forces in Rwanda, sent a coded cable to his superiors in New York to alert them of a plot to exterminate the Tutsis. He predicted it. He saw what was coming. He was pleading with the United Nations to send him the troops that he needed. And he really didn't need that many. One thing Dallaire wanted was a plane that could fly over Rwanda and jam the radio signals. And the Americans replied, this probably would violate the rights of free speech if we were to be jamming a radio station. By the time the genocide was underway, members of the international community in Rwanda had evacuated, leaving behind only a few humanitarian aid groups. To Dallaire's despair, the UN Security Council also voted to cut down most of the UN peacekeeping force in Rwanda. Violence grew more severe week after week, but major powers of the UN continued to discourage intervention, labeling the killings as an internal conflict. It's, it's very clear that uh, the outside world failed tremendously. No one in Rwanda was unaffected by the events of 1994. 75% of the Tutsi population was wiped out, and almost every Rwandan was forced to watch someone they knew get killed. Many of those who survived the genocide were horrifically injured. Thousands of children were orphaned. Refugees returned to their homes to find their entire family had been killed. One of the most pressing challenges post-genocide Rwanda faced was learning to work together as a nation once again. A considerable effort has been made to bring people together, but divisions and violence have not yet been eliminated in Rwanda. In October of 1994, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, ICTR, was established, becoming the first international tribunal to be granted a mandate to prosecute the crime of genocide. In 1995, the ICTR began indicting many higher-ranking individuals for their role in the Rwandan genocide. In September of 1998, the tribunal issued the first conviction for genocide in history. World leaders also made efforts to rectify their passivity during and prior to the genocide. After the RPF victory, a second UN mission was established, delivering extensive humanitarian relief in Rwanda for nearly two years. Still, had this energy been concentrated toward preventing or stopping the genocide, 800,000 lives could have been spared. Preventing genocide is one of the promises of the UN. It is an international responsibility, and we are all responsible. And we have a responsibility in the aftermath to communicate with Rwanda, so we responsible for, during, and after in different ways. The real goal should be creating state institutions that guarantee rights for minorities. Rwanda is an important teacher to the world at this point. I hope one lesson is don't wait. The genocide in Rwanda was possibly the most intensive killing campaign in human history, yet members of the international community decided it was somehow not significant enough to prompt even small-scale intervention. Indifference toward a violation of human rights this severe seems to contradict everything nations like the U.S. stand for. The simple fact is that no one wanted to get involved when, in Rwanda, the only thing at stake was human life. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the killings, and much of the world remains plagued by guilt over its failure to stop the genocide. With nearly one million dead to be remembered, perhaps foreign powers should stop investing in feeling guilty and start upholding their responsibility to protect, and their long-neglected promise of never again.